was a kid on the farm. And the farm was, uh, well, that was kind of interesting. It was near Hutchinson here. And uh, the, the, not only the chores, you know, milking cows, but in the summers, in the fields, shocking uh, grain, and also uh, filling silos with corn, you know. And I was just a kid but when I would fill silos. Corn was so heavy, they would, my stomach would turn sour, you know, to pulling those, uh, putting into the silo filler. I wasn't um, very close to the family. I was happy to get away. I had a pretty rough uh, life on the farm. I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. It was my choice because I wanted to get into the action. I got my uncle to take me to the uh, to the uh, courthouse in Minneapolis, where we were sworn in, and there put on the train. It's right on uh, Washington Avenue there. Right across the courthouse was a, tra a train depot, which we herded there, and never left the train until we got into San Diego. I could outperform all the kids uh, in our platoon in, 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 in a boot camp. Because most of them were from Minneapolis, St. Paul. Most of them were athletes from basketball and football and like that. That's only for a short period. And a farm, you were tough all through, you know. And so uh, I did well uh, because I could I could outrun, outperform the rest of my group. Training was rugged. It was on the Marine Corps base in San Diego, the main base. Uh, first thing I remember, when, as soon as we got boot camp, they took away our cigarettes. They said, you, you are men and not a bunch of babies that need uh, pacifiers. And, uh, which I did. But at the boot camp training, I felt so good. Lungs felt good, and that, so after that, I never t touched a cigarette after that. Because I suffered with, with, with cigarettes. I would say that the Marine Corps made a man out of me. I don't know what would happen to me. There's so many loose ends in me, but my rugged training in the Marine Corps, I settled down, I knew what I wanted in life, and uh, if I survived and through the war, I, I knew I would, I would have a future. First of all, discipline and uh, integrity. It's not by chance that um, they call the Marines uh, gentlemen when it comes to escort, escort women. Because it seems that I, every Marine I found was a gentleman. And they behave themselves as such. The Marine Raiders were a select group picked uh, from uh, the older Marine Corps. Most of them had experience in combat, some had with jungle warfare. It was the uh, Carlson's Raiders that had uh, uh, made this popular because uh, Carlson uh, had served under the communist um, regime in China, uh, learning uh, the, uh, to handle combat under a, a jungle warfare. And his training made a big difference with the Marine Corps Raiders because he, he had trained well and because their tenacity the raiders uh, did some, uh, survive in, in the jungle affairs. Of those that survived, many of them, uh, they, these were sometimes corporals or sometimes sergeants who made commissioned officers because of their uh, excellence in leadership. When, they, uh, when officers died in combat, 
The sergeants or corporals took over leadership and continued the fight uh, uh, which developed the uh, uh, res elements in the radio battalion. After basic tra training, I played in the United States Marine Corps. Band. My marching band on the base is uh, they get up uh, uh, at, at dawn, uh, is rising the sun. You, you march to the flagpole and put up a flag for the day and play. You're playing while you, while you march, you know. And the, the same, it taps at night, you, you march back and so forth. Uh, full dress, Marine Corps, uh, blue Marine Corps uniform, that's great. I also played for President Roosevelt when he came on board uh, on, on base uh, at that one time. Uh, we were in our, our a Marine Corps a green uniform. We stood two and a half hours in parade rest. In other words, in, 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 in intention. With the hot blazing at us, at us. And the, we were all sweating. <laughs> but I went, and the President Roosevelt drove into the Marine Corps base. We all played. Hail to the chief. After that, I was, uh, I went to the uh, Marine Corps base in, in uh, Moffett Field, uh, California, where I was Sergeant of the Guard. And my duties were to put on duty seven men with their dogs along the airfield perimeter, each one with a Thompson machine gun. Uh, and the purpose of, uh, of that was to secure infiltrators trying to get on the base and to destroy our lighter than air aircraft which were, were housed in, in the huge uh, hangars. It became very obvious we, we were not only getting uh, short of men and so I volunteered to go Overseas, I, I volunteered for the Marine Corps Raiders, and and I was given a, a, a squad of brig rats, people who got in trouble, got court-martialed, and they they volunteered for for service overseas. Their their records were were cleaned up. So being an acting sergeant, I took a, a, a charge of that, and uh, it was very interesting. When on Camp Pendleton, we got on some extended maneuvers and high, uh, high altitude, oh, well, mountain climbing, really. I could outperform and outrun any of the guys. And uh, after doing it, I, I earned the respect of, of the men that I deserve to be the sergeant. And so, although they, some of them gave me problems, Yet they respected because they, they knew this was the only way they would get their freedom. And they all signed, uh, went with uh, me uh, overseas and the USS uh, America ship, which was and had a new name for uh, when they were overseas. And, uh, and they were, I was in charge of them as, as went to uh, New Caledonia. And when I, at New Caledonia, they I, I turned them over to the Raider Battalion, and they were dispersed to different areas, and I never seen them again. This was a staging area for the uh, First and Second Marine Battalion. At the time they were in action, when I arrived, they was in uh, Bougainville and Macon Island, and it was on the Fort Fort Marines were on Macon Island, and this was a co contingent of the China Marines, which were the Fort Marines, and uh, which uh, held the island being occupied by the, one of the first victories in South Pacific that uh, Jap Japanese could not take. 
uh, in Guadalcanal. Uh, it was to re uh, renewal and retrain and refresh us uh, our, our battle, the latest techniques on what they have, we have learned in being in combat and it was thought so we'd be better equipped for the future uh, attacks we would be involved in. The natives of Guadalcanal hated the Japanese thing because they, they abused the natives and used them and uh, and after uh, that, <laughs> when we came back, we, we had set up an arrangement with them. If they would go in and bring in the heads of the Japanese, we would give them garden tools like rakes and hoes and so they could do, uh, take care of their plant, plantings, you know. And in the middle of the camp, they they formed a pit uh, about uh, 12 by 12, I think it would be, and real deep. And I, uh, no, we never knew what in the world was going on, why a pit right in the middle of the camp. But soon we found out, when the, when the natives started bringing us the, the heads of the Japanese, and they were buried or, or put into that pit and covered with lime and then put, put that. And so there had been several times that uh, the, the natives brought in the heads of the Japanese that they killed. When we were going into combat, we were aboard ship in the, uh, uh, and, uh, and then the, the bullhorn on the ship said, uh, uh, Sergeant Lawrence, report to the uh, chaplain. And I thought, what in the world? I, I, I was just a corporal. Right. <laughs> the chaplain wanted me to be his assistant when he was get communion to the troops on board ship. Oh, I, I felt honored that he would want me to, to help him with that. And, and I had a good rapport with the, with the chaplain. He was a really, really godly man. And uh, in doing so, uh, the troops on the board ship became jealous of me and saying uh, that I was a flunky, uh, 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 the chaplain's assistant, you know. And uh, I, I, that was not a, not a title. I, I, I was asked to do that. And right. I helped and do the uh, communion and then formed a sing-along on board ship uh, of the uh, troops, which uh, songs like In the Garden and different uh, uh, old hymns that we all, all most of them knew. And so they, 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 we had a, a, a really powerful presence of God there. But uh, I, I was being attacked by this. And I didn't know these guys if they were attacking me because of a Christian or, or the position I was uh, uh, played. But then I realized as I look back now, they were scared out of their wits. They, were, they, they, were, they knew that they were, uh, might face death and scared that not realizing I was scared as well, you know, right, right. doing that. But and when that, when we, that had, no, that must, that must have been on Guam. Uh, because when we landed on Guam, uh, I, I took a, 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 my troops up the hill uh, to the airfield. And that guy, one of those guys where they was harassing me, uh, saw this happening. Then I would not stay back with the yeah. a, a chap as a flunky. Yeah. I was fighting like the rest of them. And they said, well, hi, Jar Sergeant. I thought, you yellow belly. <laughs> That's another thing that I remember. And I have thought about that. Although in, in the revelation of now what really happened, you know, how scared they were. I didn't realize that, that they, that they were 
it's so terribly scared and and it's understandable and yet you had to go you know you know when you get up just embark on the ship you go and the boats are flying all about you you still go and go and go until you, you you reach your destination i think the one that i probably remember most is on guam we were and dropped off on the base of the island by LSTs. And then we made our way in and going up the mountain. This was, the base of the mountain uh, was uh, was the airport. It was our, our place and to go climb that mountain and uh, take the airport. There have been times that we went up a few hundred feet, found people shooting at us from the back, realizing they were Japanese into which we had to turn around and clean out the pillboxes and see that everybody was taken care of before we moved on. And of course, we lost some men too, moving up there. So it was an inch by inch fight up the mountain until we reached the top and I barely got to the top and here I find a Japanese tank. However, by that time, somebody with a bazooka took care of it and and silenced the uh, tank. These are, these are the little guys, you know, they're, they're small. Probably two men, I, I would imagine, that, that they would handle. But they, they were like uh, paper. They just fell apart once we got a good charge into them. And when we reached the top, I realized also that this was not just an ordinary airfield. This was the one of the airfields that uh, was a landing spot for U.S. Pan Am Airways. This was one of the stations that it was their hop across the ocean. They would stop at on the way back to the United States or uh, going out of the United States. There is where we were probably we, we really fought. I fought hardest because they were tenacious. They, uh, the Japanese were, they not gave up. The only way you silence them is to kill them. And then afterwards, when we did uh, capture the island, then they would j jump off the island and commit suicide because they were afraid uh, to face the Marines. The island of Guam is like on a, on a plateau high above terrain around it. So we, we came on the side where the airport was and uh, climbed the banks, uh, airport, and, and we uh, secured the airport, first of all. It was all shot up, everything, and this was also a Pan Am station. When we barely got in there, a Navy plane came and landed on the airport. I thought, those crazy fools, what are they doing at landing on the airport when we're still fighting? And out of that plane, jumped ne Admiral Nemitz. We were just shocked. God, what is he doing here? But as we looked about it, then they just came to uh, support the Marines. They were uh, fighting for their lives out there. You know? And the Navy pilot was in, was in a big hurry to get going again after <laughs> they landed. The airport there was a staging base for the Japanese to occupy Australia and New Zealand because we were getting that close. So they had sent hundreds and thousands of men there to take it back from us. And one time during the battle, we, we killed 10 Japanese to one of our Marine Corps men. It was bloody. But another good f feature about it, they had been on it so long the, the Japanese were uh, uh, losing their uh, food supply. And as a result, many of them uh, died of starvation because they couldn't get any food. I think the worst uh, moment in battle, I remember, was uh, when we were in Guam. Japanese tried to infiltrate our ranks and, and would while we were sleeping and tried to knife us or kill us in our foxholes. So I had to sleep or try to sleep with a knife 
uh, in my hand. So anybody tried to come over the foxhole to knife them right away before they could get me. And that was a nightmare. That was I remembered for a long time afterwards. Oh, you, could, you could smell them, you, you could hear them breathe. They, you, they were so close. You, it's a matter who get, gets who first. And we always had our bayonets ready. Our bayonets, by the time we came there, was a knife on the end, end of a rifle. and stab them and get them out of the way. The Japanese, when we were in, in, uh, in Guam, and the shells bursting overhead all the time, and lighting up like, like daylight, you know, all around you. And my concern, you know, you know, you didn't dare move, you know, just, we, were, we were in foxholes, but at, at times I just thought, I'm, am I going to crack, you know, because it was so tense, so consistently at it all the time, and, but this was war, you know, there, we, there was fighting for our lives. And uh, uh, I, uh, of course, daylight came, and then we, we group, and the officers took over, and we moved on. But I remember one thing, one time. This was about the time we were, about uh, when we were voting for uh, the president of the United States. That's what's Roosevelt. And. Uh, here we come. Uh, here comes a Japanese into camp. It was just uh, uh, no arms and I think that they had that surrender. Well, that's unusual. Japanese surrender. They, they, those who were responsible said, "Stay back. Just don't come close." Didn't come more than uh, 50 yards from us. <laughs> Blew up. Tried to catch and get us. I said, they'll trick anyway to kill Marines. We had a guy by the name of Lou Allen. He was a smart ass. He was going to go in. Uh, we'd, uh, we said, stay down, do not go ahead. And he wouldn't listen to, to, uh, to the, the sergeant in charge. And he went up to that, this pillbox there. They, put him, they cut him right in half. Smart ass, thinks he knows better than anybody else, you know. <laughs> So he's a dead, you know. I think he was one of my, my men. <laughs> Remember the corpsman? He was a character. When we, when we would, uh, were in combat, he had regular uh, pliers. And he goes, uh, open the, uh, kick open the uh, dead jab spot. If they had gold in them, you could pull them out. He had one of these little sacks, I think it's full of gold. He said, I, 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 I'm going to be a doctor when, when I get out of this. Bob Law. <laughs> but he was a good man. He, he, boy, when somebody was hit, boy, he was right there patching him up. He was a Navy medic. After they had, they had secured the island, and they, where they were sure that the enemy gone, in other words, uh, then we were taken back on board ship and shipped back to Guadalcanal, where we trained traditional combat. And at this time, we were the, the first Marine Raider Battalion provisional because that was that was the end of the raiders after Guam. Well, this was a blowing up uh, unstable TNT. Well, that was on Guadalcanal. Okay. Uh, what we did, we did have uh, fish fries, so we would drop uh, on. T that, I I wasn't a part of that that because that was that's dangerous stuff. Those who handled TNT would drop areas where there was heavy population of fish. And uh, they would drop these uh, unstable TNT and of course it would come bubbling up. 
fish were everywhere. So they collect the fish in baskets and had a fish fry. <laughs> They needed men for loading and unloading of ships to know where each item belonged on board ship. And that was done by uh, using templates per square inch and, and, and the, if it is a gun or uh, ammunition or uh, gasoline and where on, on the ship this would be loaded. And this was very uh, vital because we had to take in consideration if we were hit by a, a torpedo or something, where could where would it best survive? It was too hot and humid during the day, so but we worked nights, and uh, we had a great big. Well, it was, what it was uh, a uh, regular panel, uh, uh, you know. Uh, plywood panel. They would set up uh, big tables, uh, make t big tables, and then and there if we had the dimensions of a ship that were, were, was going to be used. And there's another incident when we were on Guadalcanal. I had, I had practice of uh, swimming under water with just snorkels and and I, I can get pretty pretty far deep you know and and well uh, swimmer and we had a ship that was a beach there was a Japanese ships it was blowing the whole side was blowing apart you know so uh, somebody had dared me to fly, uh, swim through the through the ship which I did by myself and I had no problem because he, the hole was so big you could uh, put uh, tanks through it or, or uh, uh, trucks. And there was no problem with that. And after that, there was a Navy nurse that wanted to, uh, to go with me. And so, uh, she was a, a officer nurse. And uh, I thought, well, if she wants to do that, okay. She was a good swimmer, and we had, took her through. And, but then I got in trouble with with uh, with the uh, officers. That's I was fraternizing with uh, <laughs> with the female. It was nothing of the sort. I just helped her go what she wanted to do, you know. And so I, I always thought that was funny. Yeah, you know, I was I, I wasn't uh, disbarred or anything like that, but uh, but I was warned. Personal friend that I that I made uh, when I was in the Marine Corps was uh, Private or PFC Bob Borman. He was a um, unusual musician. He played piano, played piano accordion, was a trumpet player, and, and we, became, uh, we became close friends. And afterwards, uh, by, by his example, I became a Christian. I saw the godliness in, in, in him. And I, of course, went into combat, and I was in, uh, through, but he, he was, stayed behind in the, he was an expert marksman rifleman and he was in on the firing range and uh, but before just before we went to Okinawa he said well I'm gonna be coming over um, Ed I'll be meeting you unfortunately he barely got on Okinawa I think he got a bullet right through his heart left behind a wife beautiful wife and all that talent went to waste. I couldn't understand, I didn't think that had much talent. Why I was spared and he was taken. But I better understand it now. We went to the Chan through the Yellow Sea. And all my life I'll never see waves as big as those. Our ships, Conway ships would disappear in the waves, completely disappear. And we thought they, Landed in 
to the bottom, but we finally made it to Tsingtao, China. And this is a stone's throw from Beijing, which is the capital of China. Our, our duty was to secure and, and put under arrest all the Japanese soldiers that we found there. So we made a, a stockade and then put every Japanese soldier in, under stockade. And then when time came and our ships were empty, we would ship them back to Japan. My duty was a, a, a part of the transport quartermaster. I was part of uh, bringing in the ships. They were coming in from sea, putting them into berths, or, or where they would uh, where they would take their turn unloading when the, when the uh, docks were free. We evacuated American missionaries who were behind the lines. That they insisted that every American missionary would be went back to China, or back from China, because it was in war, a state of war, and and the, and the communists were taking over the country. Oh, that's right. I, I had two servants. Uh, I had a man servant that came and did uh, my bunk and everything. You know, straightened up my, uh, my did my bed and everything. You know, and his wife did all my laundry and did my uh, tailoring of my shirts skin type shirt. The Chinese couldn't do enough for us. And realized that I was a Christian, they wanted me to come back and uh, to serve the Lord in China. But of course, because of communists, I never did get there. We went through the uh, northern part of, of um, on the Pacific Ocean, and halfway through, our ship uh, broke down. It's one of the new victory ships that they had built, and the uh, uh, turbine completely broke down. So we were sea, uh, and it was near Alaska somewhere. It was so cold you couldn't go on deck because you'd freeze to death. So you went in the stuffy uh, below holes until that cleared up. Half of the crew uh, coming back was seasick. So uh, the first thing we got into uh, Seattle, Washington, the naval ba base there, got plenty of pork chops and ice cream and all those good things that the Navy does have, you know. <laughs> the, the horror of it, the war, uh, with, and also the fact that I killed human beings. I, I couldn't get it out of my mind. In fact, in fact, I would walk the streets of Min in uh, Minneapolis and just uh, begging somebody to uh, put me away before I killed myself or, or killed somebody. We were staying with Grandma, and there were two bedrooms upstairs. I had one, and Edmund had the other. and. In the morning, I would make his bed after he got up, and the bed was just torn to pieces. He must have had a very bad night. And then he would uh, have his meals, his breakfast, and he would run outside after he was done eating, and it all came up. He couldn't hold any food down. I didn't see it, but mother told me that they were walking down the street and uh, sidewalk in Minneapolis and and uh, the car backfired and he just fell right down on the sidewalk. Any noise like that, you know, it sounds like a gun going off. Yeah, mother just about got a um, telegram saying your dad killed in action. Did you hear about that? He um, <laughs> he stayed behind to help someone that was wounded. He carried him back to camp. And uh, <laughs> they 
looked at him and says, you're supposed to be dead. They found his uh, dog tags by this dead person. But uh, he just stayed behind to carry someone back to camp. Otherwise, mother would have gotten the telegram, but they were able to stop it in time. That would have been a shock. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, a lot of his friends were killed. But he told me that, told us, that that's what he wanted. He wanted to die. But God didn't want him to die. It was a war where it was soon forgotten. And forgotten what all we did. And furthermore, because we were so stressed out, we, I personally clammed up. I didn't talk about it for years. You know, because I, and nobody really wanted to know what we did.